always freaks me out. Yeah, that was a harsh. <laughs> Welcome to episode 52 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. As always, I'm joined by a woman who, in this case, will be the second most infamous Mary on this episode. And I am, as always, Jess Darren. Hey, Mary, how are you? You're not just Darren. And, well, uh, hey, I kind of like that. Second most infamous. That's In this case, that doesn't say a lot. I will carry that. No, I will definitely carry that. Well, here we are at episode 52. 52. That's a, that's a long time. That's a long time for anything. But this is a special episode today, Mary. For one, it's about our first year anniversary episode. It is. And yes. we're going to make a special episode. So we're going to have a special guest today. And we've been talking for many times about... Uh, John Wilkes Booth and the Lincoln Conspiracy, and we decided to bring in one of our friends who we consider one of the experts on the subject, the Lincoln Conspiracy, and that is, of course, the great Dave Taylor. How are you, Dave? I'm great. Thanks for having me, and happy one-year anniversary. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, that was well, a little the... surprise for you that you are one-year wow. anniversary. I feel like I just walked into a like, grocery store, and you're like, you're a 100th <laughs> customer, and you get something. So well, the amazing. first anniversary is the Dave anniversary, so we have to make you know, that. Oh, yes, that's right. That is you know, silver and gold. You get to nerd out with us person. tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. And I didn't get you anything. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, you know, your presence is your presence. How's oh, that? that's that? good. good. Darren, always the sweetheart. Ooh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it is an honor to have you on. It's great. We've wanted to talk to you for a while about this. We've wanted to talk about this subject for a long, long time. And we're going to talk about the Lincoln conspirators, and we're going to give John Wilkes Booth the night off. He's been he's been run through the mud a little bit, so we're going to leave him off the, the subject here a little nice. bit. Nice, get the mud. <laughs> See the that? Puns, the nice. puns. <laughs> but we're going to talk about the um, the other guys. Now, as we know, we're going to real briefly talk that you know there were nine put on trial. We're not going to talk about uh, Michael Laughlin, Samuel Mudd, Edwin Spangler. Samuel Arnold or John Surratt Jr. We're going to talk about the primary of the four who were tried and executed. That would, of course, be David Harold, George Atzerodt, Lewis Powell, slash Payne, but he'll always be Powell to me. And, of course, Mary Surratt. So we'll have some fun talking about that. And Dave has been around the, around the block a little bit with this. He's spoken at the, the Springfield Museum, the Lincoln Museum, and he um, does a lot of the, the booth escape tours. So he's someone who um, is definitely a a list person when it comes to this um this subject so uh, so again welcome and um we'll have some fun tonight talking about the uh the old gang oh absolutely you know they they paid they had so much fun they just died laughing or yeah, exactly. uh, maybe not laughing exactly <laughs> yeah. well they so, got caught hanging around there it is oh, another we need the drum to dun dun how yeah. you don't already have the rim uh, shot i'm at the end of my rope with these jokes so we'll oh my on. that's enough <laughs> I will not be denied. Oh, I was just about to make <laughs> okay, a joke. Okay, okay, okay. We'll let that go. We'll this let is that painful. Go. Painful. <laughs> Ooh, it's, it's Lewis painful. How did this last a whole painful. year? <laughs> painful. I don't have any. You didn't tell me I had to prepare puns. <laughs> oh, it's okay. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. So, so Dave, real how, quick. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mary. I was going to say, I think we're going to ask the same thing. How, just briefly, how did you get into the, the Lincoln assassination and studying like all things to, to do with it? Uh, yeah, so I grew up in Illinois, and so Lincoln is everywhere. So I was the strange kid when growing up in the land of Lincoln who was like, oh, yeah, cool, Lincoln. But uh, how did he die? Okay, tell me more about what happened there, just because it seems so... It's so crazy to me that someone could kill who in Illinois is you know, revered as our country's greatest president. And so how anyone could want to murder him. And so I just started doing research kind of as a, I guess not research as a kid, just reading. And then when I was in high school, I was a drama nerd. So shout out to all you musical lovers. Um, and I was introduced to the musical Assassins by Stephen Sondheim, which is a very strange uh, musical, but it is about presidential assassins. And John Wilkes Booth is in that along with the other assassins and both successful and attempted. And then that is what kind of bridged the gap from when I was really into musical theater and then getting me back into history. And then I just started reading about John Wilkes Booth and the plot and then just learning more about the guys we're to talk about tonight and just realizing it was far more complex than I ever thought. And I've just been reading and writing and speaking about it in my free time ever since. I just find it fascinating. And I know Darren does too, kind of the mm-hmm. same same basic story. It just bites Absolutely. you when you're young. Mm-hmm. So in your drama days, do you ever find yourself calling anybody a sock doggling old man trap? Absolutely. <laughs> and nobody understood yes. what I was <laughs> talking about. <laughs> crickets <laughs> was the biggest joke back in 1865 and crickets now. Uncultured swine. That's what we're dealing with today. <laughs> Too funny. Well, I think you were in good company with us because as we were talking about before we started recording this, it was the assassination that got Darren and I into this whole civil war obsession, you know, and I guess ultimately what led to us doing this podcast. Uh, 
you know, together. So we are very, very happy to to have you on here to join us to to talk to us about this. And I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Absolutely. So again, we what can we, we talk about the, the we're gonna talk about the four guys who three men and one woman who um who pay the ultimate price for following John w- John Wilkes Booth down the primrose path to the gallows is what is what they really did. And so we'll start with David Harold. Okay. Now David Harold, as we know, you know born in 1842 in Washington, D.C., seven sisters, three brothers who all died when they were infants. So he was the only boy growing up in a house full of women, which must have been awesome in a lot <laughs> of different ways. Um, but it was came from a good upper middle class family. I mean, his father owned a bunch of properties in the area, some in Baltimore, some in Washington. But he was also, he was a very impressionable kid. He was somebody who was quite witty. He was somebody who liked to hang with the popular kids. He was popular in somebody who I think was someone who was probably would have been easy to manipulate because he was so into wanting to be, I don't want to say accepted, but he wanted to be in that inner circle. I think that was a big part of his childhood. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, you played exactly when people talk about, you know, Booth's impact on, on these people who we're going to talk about tonight. And Davey falls into the, you know, Booth was this, I mean, he's this world famous actor. I mean, he is just, it's hard for us to imagine because we see him now as just the villain. And it, it's so easy sometimes to just put him as, oh, he was the, the bad Booth. You know, he wasn't as good an actor as his brother Edwin. His brother Edwin also got to perform for decades after because he didn't mm. kill the president and die. And so Edwin was very good. But, you know, when Edwin was 20, six and he was good but so was john wilkes so you have to we always kind of i think we detach booth from who he was then in 1864 1865 before his crime and we associate what he is now which is just this 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 almost stereotypical characteristic like arch villain twiddling his mustache and plotting the death of lincoln but to davy and to these other people who we're going to talk about like he was just this worldly uh educated famous talented person and everyone kind of he had that mag magneticism around him that Davy especially was drawn to. And as you said, Darren, you know, being the, the only boy and with seven sisters and then his father dies in 1863, he is the man of the house, you know, two years before all this with the assassination that having this worldly, you know, slightly older man, like kind of be this person who takes an interest in you had a huge impact on him. Yeah, and and for whatever too, reason, oh, sorry, Darren, go ahead. I was gonna say, for whatever reason, you know, you know, people think of David Harold, you think of maybe there was, he was not quite all there. There was something missing. And it's tough to say because of his personality, but reportedly his father left him out of the will, basically, and that he didn't want him in no way in charge of the family finances after he died, which probably speaks a lot to what he was. But reportedly, he meets John Wilkes Booth of April, in April of 1863 during his performance of The Marble Heart which reportedly is the same performance a couple days away as when he met Tad Lincoln. And that's, that's the story and met him backstage. He, and you know, he's must've been just completely starstruck had to have been. And to your point, Dave, knowing a superstar like Booth, he got to know him a little bit, ran into him off and on here and there. And it must've been a situation where in a manipulative type of guy, it must've been a moth to a flame for a guy like Booth later on. Well, I think it's kind of like you have to think of a really famous actor today. And that's how I try and explain the assassination sometimes to people. It's like, it would be like, you know, I've sometimes said Leonardo DiCaprio. That's what it would have been like these people were hanging out with as you think of a famous actor. For some reason, I always think of Leo. I don't know why, but... I just do, and this Leo could do it. Let's yeah. let's make the a new biopic, and Leo can be both. He's a little old, but he can do it. He can do yeah. anything. Like it, it's like Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio is hanging out with these guys. So of course you're going to be starstruck, you know. And that's how I kind of, you know, put it to people this time. Like imagine one of the most well-known, famous actors, and he's killed the president. But then think of it in the context of imagine these, you know, people who are hanging out with him. And he's bringing them into this conspiracy and he's able to, in you know, he's very manipulative with them. He's able to latch on to certain parts of their personalities and draw them in, you know. And I just, like I said, it, Leonardo DiCaprio is what it would have been like they, they were hanging out with. Yeah, and everyone wanted to have something to do with him. Like, why yeah. wouldn't you? Of course, if I, had, if I could be friends with Leo, I'd be friends with Leo. Yeah, exactly. Well, especially, you know, he, you know, he gets to know him quite a bit. He meets him a couple of times off and on. Again, this is all, you know, reportedly because the, the, the best thing we were saying before the best thing about the Lincoln conspiracy is it's the stories and whether they're true or not they're stories and you talk about them and some might be true some might be not 
but because of the fact that most of the primary sources got destroyed by whoever had them for fear of incrimination, we're left with, with, with basically wives' tales. And that's kind of what it is. But allegedly, you know, um, this is a guy who, as a clerk at a farm, he, he went to school for pharmacology, and I think it was Georgetown he went to, I believe. Uh, yes. Yep. And, uh, and so he ended up, the, their story is he delivered castor oil to the White House, yeah. to President Lincoln. Um, so, you know, I don't know what's going on with old Abe, but, you know, David Harold's <laughs> to the rescue, I suppose. It was, maybe <laughs> you know? it was for Mary. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> but didn't but do her much know, good. I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. It, it did not. It, yeah, yet another Mary. Another yeah. That's <laughs> There's something about the Marys. Yeah, there is. There's a movie called. They should make a movie called something. That's like a, Mary. Good that's that. that's a good, damn good <laughs> idea. That's a damn good idea. But fast forward fall of 1864 is, you know, when Harold is going to meet Booth again um, in Washington, D.C. And this, this is when allegedly Booth tries to get him into his plot, into his conspiracy to, to go ahead and kidnap him. Um, and the story, again, real quick, is, you know, the prisoner exchange program had been eliminated. It was called the, um, the Dix Hill Cartel. And this was a situation where you were, you, were trading, you were trading prisoners during the Civil War. And for many reasons, there was, the, there was a Fort Pillow massacre with, um, you know, with uh, Nathan Bitter Forrest. It got, it got halted by Lincoln. So the plan was, well, if we can get this exchange program going again, um, you know, we, we can get some of our guys back. Now, the rebels refused to exchange black soldiers and white officers, and that was a big problem with it as well. Um, Lincoln had that thing, General, General Order 100, what was called the Libra Code, which was basically demanded that all soldiers, black or white, were supposed to be treated the same, and that was not going to fly with the rebs. So Booth's thinking as well, if we can kidnap Lincoln, we can hold him for a king's ransom and at least get the exchange program open again. That seems to be the most common the common uh, common thinking of why the conspiracy plot to kidnap him existed. Yeah, and that's what I mean. That's what he tells these these people early on. Like the other people were not talking about because they were just involved in this abduction plot. It was a little harebrained, even to their you know uh, opinions. You know, Bob being like, I don't know if this is really reasonable, but if we can do it, yeah, it would be great, sort of thing. And I think Davy, you know, being you know as young as he is, twenty two year old, twenty two years old, I think at this point, and he's got this actor who's telling him, I have this idea. It can bring us fame because we'll be heroes to the confederacy you can bring a fortune because the idea is perhaps the confederate government would of course pay handsomely for an abducted abraham lincoln um and you can be part of this adventure with me it just it really drew in uh davy who though he was you know a young man at that point that he was described as being boyish he wanted adventure you know he had he was missing a father figure even though booth wasn't old enough to be his father but still was i think uh wanting that in his life and i think one of the biggest misconceptions with davy is that as you as as you pointed out, Darren, that there is this idea that he was maybe not all there, you know, that he's Agreed. mentally inept oh, and stuff I was like that. Thinking that you get it everywhere. I was reading about that. I'm like, this is a kid who, you know, he's a pharmacy clerk. He's, I, I don't know if that conception of him not being all there is completely true. I think he was just the kid that wanted to be popular. And when somebody like Booth comes along, you know, and, and Booth is the type of guy that he's bringing people into his inner circle that he is going to benefit from. And Davy, when he was a kid, he would go bird hunting. And because of that, that made him very familiar with the Maryland countryside. That is going to be so beneficial to Booth. So he's looking for this kind of mutually beneficial relationship. Like, how is this going to help me? So obviously, in being the charismatic person he is, Booth is going to come to know Davy and learn this about him. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's mm. going to bring him in. And because he knows that about Davy, he's going to be really, you know, like play into what Davy wants, which is yeah, the, liked by him. Those years of going with his father hunting in Maryland, you know, certainly, you know, knowing those back roads heading down that way was, was going to be appealing because why, why else would Booth have anything to do with a guy like that? He's going to play off of whatever he can. Every one of the people we're going to talk about, Booth saw something that he could take from. And for David, it was clearly his knowledge of, of the countryside. No yeah, and, and Davy, you know, and going back to the idea of him being not all there or whatever, Davy was the most, other than Dr. Mudd, Davy had the most education out of all mm -hmm. the conspirators, including Booth. Yeah. And so, you know, Davy wasn't, wasn't that. And the misconception comes because that was the tactic that his defense took at the trial to try to save him. Because Davy was kind of, you know, between a rock and a hard place after the assassination and his capture, he escaped with Booth. I mean, he, he spent 12 days and only briefly left Booth to then rejoin him back at the Garrett farm. And so, you know, there wasn't a lot of hope for Dave, even though he didn't kill anyone, but with law of conspiracy and everything, he was in a real bad place. And so the best 
possible defense that they had for him was to play him off as simple minded and that he was easily manipulated, manipulated and things like that. And part of that might be true, but I think it's been way overblown in years since. And really, you know, Davey always gets the short end of the stick that, you know, some books played off as if he's almost mentally retarded as if, you know, he's in Ken Burns. Yeah, they they play him, and I don't. I think it's Donald da, uh, um, Dow's book about Lincoln, where I think later on he said he didn't know much about the life of like the Lincoln conspirators, especially Davy, and so he made a low life for them that he didn't, you know, because they're so hard to find research, as Darren pointed out, because th- some of these people really were nobodies, you know, and that's why too. Booth was a famous actor. We have a lot of people talking about him afterward, but a lot of these other Davy's a pharmacist clerk. He's twenty two years old. There's not much in his life that has happened that's been worth noting, and so we don't have a lot, and so you have this fabrication of all of the conspirators as being just low life villains because it's easier than actually trying to figure them out yeah it's definitely the lazy man's boot that every route that every one of these guys must have been these guys knuckle dragging child eating monsters every single one of them and i think what people you know as we talk about these people it's important to realize the four people we're going to talk about they had lives they had families they had dreams they had goals they were religious in a lot of cases Every one of them followed Booth for different reasons. And whatever they were, as misguided as they might have been, these were not mindless drones. Even Powell, for that part, they were all, they were all different, you know, individual, smart thinking people who chose this route for whatever reason. And, um, and I think that gets kind of thrown under the rug a lot. You know, they're, they're these, they're these watching these mafia movies from the 20s are all just these machine gun guys in the backseat firing guns. These, these are people, every one of them, who if Booth never came along, they would have been nondescript to history, but they probably would have lived somewhat of a virtuous life, every single one of them. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know? I, I definitely think so. And I think, you know, like I said about Davey, I think he was, you know, like we were mentioning about Weichmann, you know, uh, we probably won't get much into Weichmann in the story, but very much the pop, the kid that wanted to be popular. Davey had something that Booth needed, and that was knowledge of the Maryland countryside. And he played into that, and he brought Davey into his inner circle. But yeah, I think Davey, Davey also had loyalty, you know, exactly. and out of all the conspirators, as so I say, 12 loyal. days with him, the most yeah. loyal, you know, you could be. And I mean, and that is, you know, to anyone else, if you if Davey had been that loyal to anyone else, you know, it would have hopefully been a benefit in his life. Unfortunately, he put his loyalty in the one man, you know, he shouldn't have. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you know, you wonder kind of, you know, why he's doing that. But I think it, it goes back to the whole, this is the, the kid that, that wanted to be popular and he's liked by this popular actor. So he's going to, he's willing to go literally like to the end for this. Whatever, guy. whatever it was with, with Booth, he saw something in Booth that he stuck with because the night of the assassination, he wasn't very loyal to Powell. Right. I mean, he kind of he kind of turned but his heel and took up on him pretty he, quick. But but isn't there stories that he might not have even been with Powell? That well, again, it's all it's that's yeah. what, that's what's great about this is I mean, whatever the case was, um, he he ended up being focused on Booth, obviously, and to stick with someone you know sticking in the woods. Uh, and Dave, you and I have both spent, spent time in the pine thickets. We know how, <laughs> yep. how miserable that can be. Yeah. <laughs> but, but especially when you're being not, we weren't being hunted by dogs and cavalry and everybody else. But and a Canadian, but it takes a, it, well, <laughs> a Canadian, and, and, uh, Edward Doherty, I can chase yep. down. You know, you probably heard the Anne Murray albums playing, and that's why. I <laughs> Here, could I have this dance for the rest of my life playing? Here they come. It's like, no. I smell maple syrup and bad bacon. <laughs> and ketchup chips. Yeah. Exactly. Is that Tim Horton's theme song? <laughs> oh my God, are they eating poutine again? <laughs> we need some petrol. God. But, but, you know, he's an interesting guy. The next guy I want to talk about is George Atzerodt. You know, Atzerodt's a guy, he's completely different background. You know, this is a guy who was born in 1835 in Prussia. And he moved to the United States in 1844 um, with his family to Baltimore um, to a place that's ironically called Germantown because that's where all the Germans were, which is just northwest of Washington. Um, he lived at a farm. But this is a guy who obviously he, you know, he's one of the hardworking Germans who comes over here. He ends up being a coach maker in Washington with his brother and goes into his brother, John, uh, sets up his business out of a place called Port Tobacco, Maryland, which is a great little place right on the Potomac River, by the way, mm-hmm. if you go. And he ferries you know, people across during the Civil War. That's well, that that's the thing is that, you know, he, you know, when the Civil War starts, you know, and this is where, you know, John, his brother ends up taking a job with the Maryland provost 
Um, and so he kind of goes one direction and, and George left on the other side. So George, he stays in Port Tobacco to keep that carriage business alive. And he's got to make some extra money because John's going to basically disappear and he's going to need to find a way to supplement his money. He gets married. He has a young girl named Edith who shows up and he needs to make some money. So he becomes a rebel smuggler to, for some extra money. And, and this is going to be, you know, why would Booth be interested in him? Well, this is the reason why. He is going to find a way to ferry supplies and mail across the Potomac through the Union lines and be very, very good at it. And he's going to be a, you know, carriage maker by day and smuggler by night. How's that for a, how's that for a LinkedIn resume <laughs> right there? I mean, he, you he's know? also the only, I think he's the only immigrant and he's not an American citizen either. That's involved no. in conspiracy. You know, and he ends up meeting John Surratt you know, down in that area, who pulls him into that into Booth's plot. And they hire George to obviously get across the Potomac as part of that that Confederate underground. So he's an interesting guy too, because he's an immigrant and his motivation, it seems anyway, is clearly financial. Clearly. Absolutely. I mean, again, that fame and fortune, you know, he didn't care about the fame so much, but the fortune, the idea that you know, all I have to do is do what I already do kind of as a pastime, this time just with Lincoln and I will get a huge payday. Fine. Like that sounds great to me. I'm, you know, mm -hmm. he's Confederate in his leanings, but it's funny. I see George as kind of like he would, if it was reversed, if he hadn't lived in Southern Maryland and he was somewhere else where he was, I don't know if he was in the South and there was union people there who were paying him to do something clandestine for them. I think George hundred percent would have done that. Oh, I, I agree think you, you could have bought his sympathies for whatever you wanted. I agree. So picture, you picture your carriage maker, you're German and there's not, you know, not a lot of real strong sentiment towards foreigners in this country. Thank God that's changed, <laughs> but especially in the civil war with Germans, right? Um, especially here comes John Surratt offering you an opportunity to make a lot of money. And to your point, Dave, I already do this. What's, yeah. the, what's, the, what's the big deal? I've got a baby. I've got a wife. My brother just took off. I can't run this carriage company on my own. The Civil War basically kind of really screwed that up. So, of course, he's going to agree. And the thing about, about old George, though, was, you know, he, you know his plan, he was, he was going to wait to pour tobacco and then – and then to get, you know, ferry Lincoln across. He was never even supposed to go to Washington. He was just supposed to stay down there. And the whole thing kind of went off kilter once the whole thing went on. Yeah, he, he was just like, it was just another job. And, and this, I mean, there's other people in this. The, the, the story is that in Southern Maryland, everyone knew about Booth's abduction plot. You know, that it was the worst kept secret. Like the story down there is like everybody, you go down there and you find people who've lived there for generations and be like, oh yeah, yeah. We heard mumblings that, that there was going to be a kidnapping of Lincoln who was going to come through here. And so, you know, everyone, and they were all Confederate sympathizers down there. So it was just like, yeah, sure. And, you know, one of the other gentlemen who, plays into the escape but later on thomas harbin who is introduced to booth by dr mudd and everything kind of does the same thing where booth's like hey i'm gonna kidnap lincoln bring him down here will you help me and he's like well if you bring him down here sure because i'm already doing these underground confederate activities and george kind of just fell in the same way with the promise of a payday but i do you know i find it interesting as we know later on george is the one who just confesses all the time once the arrests happen and he's hoping yeah. to not get in trouble if he just becomes state's witness so he's saying everything which makes him somewhat unreliable but also the best source we have because he just mm -hmm. names names and just just lays it out to anyone who wants to including his his brother-in-law or his brother you know later on and i just like how he talks about how well the first place he met john wilkes booth though was uh at mary Saras that, you know, John Surratt came down to hire him and he was like, oh, yeah, I guess so. Um, but then uh, George goes up to Washington to meet Booth personally. And it happens in the parlor of the Surratt boarding house. It does. And what we don't know if they sang karaoke, Mary. Well, right. there. we don't <laughs> know. They that. They very well could have maybe a little, you know, uh, of Weeders name or that song is maybe they did a little song. But <laughs> but he yeah, he ends up and he ends up in Washington and he's going to he's going to end up taking Booth and Harold down a port tobacco and to show them the boat that that they're going to be using, right? And this is the boat that John Surratt had basically bought. We'll talk about guys like Richard Smoot and those guys later on. But 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 the um, his his plan for that point was just utilitarian. He was going to be a a tool, a, a wrench. They're going to bring him down here. I'm going to get them across. I'm going to get paid, and that's going to be it. And the sad part about old George here was, as this whole thing went on, you know, when he says later on that he didn't sign on for the assassination, I tend to believe him. I really do. I do too. And, and the thing about it, though, is he was a guy 
who really did whatever he could to turn state's evidence at this trial, you know, and, and all the, the prosecutors did was just so, okay, okay, and then use other people to cor- corroborate that and then screw them is kind of what they did. Oh, yeah. So, so <laughs> he, um, it, it, was, it was unfortunate for him. Um, I wish in that conspir- the conspirator movie that they maybe did a little more into him because I think he's such an interesting character to he's study. He's one of my fa- he he's an interesting one. He's the one after Mary Surratt that I like to study. And I guess like you know my one image of him that I have is in the Killing Lincoln documentary that National Geographic did, where he's sitting there in that hotel wherever they are with Booth, and he said, "I signed up for kidnapping, not killing." And it was just like when I saw that, it really you know hit me again. I'm like, wow, maybe this guy really did not you know, you know, they're dragging him in this more and more. And like, you see Booth in the, in, you know, the camera flips to Booth and he's like, you're in this and mm-hmm. you're not getting out at all. And that just shows you like, you know, again, it goes back to how manipulative Booth could be that he knows he's got George and George, I think at that point knows he can't get out of this. Yeah, he's blackmailed for you know lack of a better word because yeah even after so this abduction plot isn't taking place they they, they bring george in in like january of 65 yeah and then by then it's it the whole entire plan that booth had started you know in the fall was about kidnapping lincoln when he was going to the soldier's home which he's not doing in the middle of winter now and so the you know george then just ends up kind of hanging around and, and booth is paying for some of his expenses in washington and things yeah. like that and so he's just waiting for this thing to happen or not Either way, you know, he's getting, you know, his accommodations paid for by this famous actor. And then when, you know, it turns and suddenly it's April and suddenly Booth on April 13th is like, hey, tomorrow I'm going to kill the president and Lewis Powell's going to kill, you know, Secretary of State and you, George, you're going to kill the vice president. That's when George suddenly has been like, like, wait a minute, all these things I've done these last few months where I've been taking care of booth's horses or sharing them or like looking to sell them or like interacting with him and all these people now i've realized i've just completely incriminated myself in all of this i've, I've just and that is when i i agree that i don't i don't think booth ever i mean uh, george ever had any inkling it was going to be assassination until booth already had him roped into it regardless yeah, and, and he was like told him he's like by the way you're going to go kill the president. yeah he even yeah. says at one point when he says i'm not going to do it you know george i mean again we can only trust what george says yeah. um and he but in one of his confessions he said he balked and said i won't do it uh and then that's when booth says well then maybe davy will do it but what will become of you and mm-hmm. so he had him, he had George wrapped around his finger. And, you know, we always, you know, in a lot of documentaries and stuff, they say, well, on the night of the assassination, Booth, you know, shoots Lincoln, Powell stabs Seward, and George Astorot gets drunk. And I've done it for the laugh before, too. But really, I think instead of taking it as cowardice, I think it's his conscious, the conscience that he yeah. didn't want to do it. He couldn't bring himself to do it because I don't think he, first of all, believed in murder. And he especially, you know, even though he'd been blackmailed into it, he still wasn't going to pull the trigger for Booth. Yeah, there's just something I I don't know. I've always like seen George as being that way, like not in it for he's like because he's just finding out about this. Like it's not his cause. Like it's not his cause. He's supposed to do it. He's like, what? But you know, (laughs) the thing about it is this. And now you're telling me I have to do this. He did. He did hang around that Kirkland house, though. That's he checked in. He he followed Booth's orders. he, he, He didn't make a run for it. He so Booth at that point was a spider and you got in the web and you were stuck. And that was it. But he, you know, he he stung, he hung around and is you know even you know according to the Weichmann book he he could have he he could have ran but he didn't so I don't know if he was vacillating but I don't think there was ever a, a situation where he was actually going to go through with that yeah I don't think it was oh. ever going to happen. You know. and, and Booth realized that too. We were talking about Davy and you know Darren's point about how he bailed on Powell and Mary. You brought up in Michael Kaufman's book. There's very little evidence, like concrete evidence, that Davy went with Powell to um, the Sur- uh, sorry to Seward's house. There is only an article that came out in a newspaper, if I'm remembering correctly, like a few days after the assassination, that said that that he was lead. But we don't have a source. I don't think we have a good source for that, like where it came from. And so, and I think there's good evidence that part of George's confessions are accurate that I think Booth seeing that George was faltering and even the blackmail may not be enough. Really Kaufman puts out there that Davy was supposed to be the point man that maybe he led him to, he led Powell to Seward, but then he deliberately left not worrying about chaos or any of that stuff, but to go check on George and to maybe the two of them together, were going to make an attempt on um, the vice president. But at that point, George had abandoned the Kirkwood, locked the door and, and left. And that's why Davey didn't have any other choice other than get on his own horse and escape after Booth. 
What was that story where where people heard the pounding on the door? It's likely David yeah. knocking on the door. And yeah, so, the yeah, mm-hmm. the lady so, who was the so, the, the 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 wife of the hotel keeper said around ten fifteen, someone was running in the hallway, pounding on the door, a door, and that the assumption is that was Davy looking for George. Mm-hmm. And that, that's, again, we, we to the beginning, that's what's great about these stories is that you never know. Was it David looking for George? Maybe he was the one who, per, per John Wilkes, make sure he gets there. Um, but again, you never know. You never know. So that, that's probably- But also we going. have all that stuff in George's room that he locked that belonged to Booth. Like, yeah, and, yeah. and stuff that were, that could have helped him. There was a map in there and there was Booth's coat along with some money and other mm-hmm. things. So the assumption is that Davy, even if he wasn't going to help George, wanted to get that stuff for the escape, but because George had locked it and left, he was stymied and had to just leave. And that's why Booth, you know, we talk about his famous diary that Booth, you know, just has this because he doesn't have the supplies he was supposed to have on the run. He's got to make do with what he had. That's why he used a diary of toilet paper, by the way. Just saying. That's right. Absolutely. He used a diary of toilet <laughs> paper. I've been saying that for years. I've been saying that for years. Oh, it's absolutely that's accurate. Yeah. That's the missing. Sorry. Sorry, Benjamin Gates. I don't, he needed, <laughs> I don't know if he needed I don't know if he needed that many pages, but he definitely used some of them oh, for toilet paper. I don't know. You've been to the Surratt boarding house? You've been to the boarding house? I've never had problems with the sushi. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you could you could say you could, you could say all you want about Atsara, but but I think he's kind of the helpless victim in this whole thing where he got pulled into it financial reasons. He had a supportive family. He had a brother who who left and left him the business basically the founder. The Civil War took care of that. He had to find his way. It doesn't justify what he did, but you can see the wheels in his mind going. I've, I just got to do what I what I've been doing, and I'm going to get a bunch of money. Why wouldn't I? Yeah, I think again, the, the hope was it wasn't going to happen, too, because, I mean, he's the one he doesn't attack the vice president. And then he goes toward Fords and afterwards and sees the chaos that's going on. And then he doesn't know what to do. He spends I mean, you would think of if I'm committed, I have an escape plan. He didn't because I think it really wasn't something he thought he was hoping wouldn't happen. It was a bad dream. And Booth was just being crazy. And that's why he rides the the stagecoach, you know, all night, then just goes to a hotel, checks in, leaves early in the morning without paying and tries to make his way out because he's like, what do I do now? Because I never thought that this was going to happen. Yeah, he always thought it was probably just going to be kidnapping. And, you know, he finds out April 13th. Oh, no, no, it's not. They want me to kill the vice president. Like, where does your mind go as a human? Like, and what, and what do you do? Because I think Booth was manipulated enough that even if George had straight up said, you know, we talk about, you know, and I've noticed before, like they all had the, all of these people we're talking about. I think the reason they pay the ultimate price is because the evidence shows to some degree that they knew what Booth was going to do and they did nothing to stop it. Some of them actively assisted in it and some of them like George just didn't do anything about it. And, um, but at the same time, if I was in the same shoes, what could I do? I mean, you'd yeah. want to feel like I would be the hero. I would go to the Metropolitan Police Force and be like, John Wilkes Booth is gonna shoot Lincoln. But at the same time, like, first of all, would they believe you? And Booth had wrapped him around so much in all of this exactly. that what repercussions would it be for me? It's not worth the risk if I can somehow just get out of it. And the other thing too is he is a German immigrant who is not yeah, who's going to believe a citizen. Him. And mm-hmm. you know, you, you look at you know my my favorite core in the AOP is the eleventh core. They're primarily German. They don't get treated very well, you know. So there's this kind of either on either side he's not looked upon very highly. So some of that could have factored into it, you know. Like I know Kaufman writes about how he was seen differently from the other conspirators. Like you know, people would see Booth and Surratt as being very gentleman like. And then Adzerat was kind of the awkward guy. Old plug tobacco. Yeah, who looked really, weird and hunched over. Hunched over. Didn't really fit in with them. Dirty. You know? And it, I, I think that's kind of the, the culture, you know, with who he was from, the prejudice against him as a German, as an immigrant, as somebody who's not an, an American citizen. And I think, you know, when you're looking at George Adzerat and what has happened to him, what he goes through, like, you have to think about that, too, that that's some of that is factoring into um, into his story as well. Yeah, it is a lot. Now, before before we go on to Powell, this is possible. We'll take a little quick digression. What, what do you think the point was really when Booth decided he was going to kill Lincoln? Um, I think a lot of it was Booth's own vanity. I, I truly think the war was coming to an end. He saw it, and I don't think he could live with the idea that uh, with the war over and everyone coming back as heroes, you know, and the respect that 
people would have that they fought in the war, even, you know, on both sides that Booth, you know, he had been kind of because he was affluent, had, was able to just piss away the Civil War without having to get his hands dirty. And I think the combination of Booth being a Shakespearean actor uh, who wanted to sp- who acted out these being the savior of the Republic of being the Brutus who slays the Caesar and him believing that Lincoln had become a tyrant combined with the fact that though it was almost, it was, it was already too late to do anything about it. It really was. But Booth may be thinking that if I, I want the greatness associated with this great event in which so many people have died and fought and gained honor from, this is what I'm going to do. I think it was almost pure vanity with uh, the idea that it would help the Confederacy, the South would rise. All of that, I think, is just lies. Booth told himself to just uh, deal with his ego, that he couldn't deal with the fact that he had plotted something great and had planned all these wonderful things that were going to happen to him. And now it was for nothing. And I need Mm -hmm. that greatness that I guaranteed myself. But do you think it kicked in earlier, though, is my saying to you? Because, you know, there's, there's the stories. There's the story of the Lawn Letter, for example. There's a story of the Charles Shelby Letter, right, where some might be urban myth might be true. The story where, you know, someone sent a letter to the National Hotel with all these details of the assassination before and was delivered to the wrong room and Booth never got it. And then, of course, there was the Selby Letter, which is the, the one in 1864 that a woman f- saw a guy look like Booth. She dropped a letter of the train and it talked about... And this is the letter that allegedly that that really freaked Lincoln out that he held on to in his desk out of all the assassination letters this is the one that resonated with him. So do you put any credence on those? And, or do you, and do you think no. that there's any sort of any truth to that stuff? Because I mean, there were threats against Lincoln, no doubt. But in terms of them being connected to Booth, like, like yeah, the, one of the first witnesses is Mary Hudspeth in New York talking about how mm-hmm. she found this letter in a gutter on a streetcar. But even then, it wasn't that it was Booth. It was just like, I, I think the government was just trying to put it they wanted to put it all together at, at the trial to be like, look at how it was the Confederacy. Remember, the big, the whole reason for the trial wasn't really to put those eight people on trial. It was to put Jefferson Davis. It was to a prelude to Jefferson Davis and all those traitors and to be like, they are the ones that killed our president. These were the little people who did it, pulled the trigger, helped them out. But they mm-hmm. were the ones that did it. And I just that was just the wrong way to go. And I think that all those letters, you know, that I, I wish we had a smoking gun really for Booth to directly connect him to Jefferson Davis and the Confederates. But I, in all of the reading I've done, I've seen hints of it. You know, John Surratt was a Confederate courier. He mm-hmm. had involvement with some of these guys, but a direct link, I just, is not there in my opinion. It was like they, it was in a lot of cases, it was like they, they had the answer to the question and they had to go find the question to let up to the answer. The Selby yeah. letter is pretty, pretty obvious. They, had, they brought in a handwriting expert who swore it was Booth's handwriting and they did this, it was all that stuff that kind of played it. But I think it, they had the answer and they needed to prove it. And I think that they, they were going backwards. I just, it just popped in my head because that, that, was, that was a lot of what we're talking about with this stuff is a lot of the stuff that is clearly urban legend. And I think the only, I mean, obviously Booth shot Lincoln, no question. Powell attacked Seward. Everything else, you can make a case of who the hell knows. That's what's that's the that's the reality of this is that there was so much stuff lost and there's so much stories and so many rumors and so many just hearsay that it's fun to talk about because you know we'll never know. And we'll never know. I, I think it definitely was vanity, you know, and just like he's watching the Confederacy die and he didn't expect that. And there's that quote from him, you know, and who knows if it's true where he's, you know, in the, in, in the star saloon, right? And he said, when I leave the stage, I will be the most talked about man in America. Yeah. And that goes back to the vanity, whether that quote is true. Well, I say that whenever I leave the bar, so it doesn't, doesn't, yeah. that doesn't matter. I know. That's me, I know. <laughs> <laughs> like your tagline. Oh, we know Darren's drunk. He's talking about being the most famous yeah, man in America like, again. You all slurring when I leave the stage, Mary. Time to go home now. <laughs> Did I tell you about the time I left the stage, Mary? <laughs> Light my cigar on the lamp while I'm on the street. That scene in Killing Lincoln where he likes Oh, that, get, like, that, that gets the, the blood going. The that, I see that. That's, all right, we got to talk about Louis, right, Louis Powell now. We got to talk about Louis Powell, okay? And I always call him Lewis Powell. We'll talk about how he gets called Payne here in a little bit. Um, but it's always Lewis Powell. That, that's his name. Born in Alabama, born in 1844. I believe he had 11 brothers and sisters. He had a big, big family. Um, he ended up moving to Florida when his family's finances kind of went kaput. And he's the guy who has real Civil War experience. So he's part of the second Florida. And he joins on the end of May 1861. So he joins pretty quick. Ends up fighting at the siege of Yorktown. With Magruder, 18, uh, 1862. He's part of Jubal Early's Brigade, Mary. We talk about him a lot. He fights mm-hmm. the Second Manassas in Tiedem, uh, Fredericksburg. But Gettysburg is where he gets all of his chops. So 
he was shot in the wrist either on the second day as part of Lane's brigade, either on the picket charge or the second day. No one really knows for sure. But he ends up being held at Pennsylvania College, which is Gettysburg College now, which makes me think it was probably on the third day when he was probably shot because the second day was still held by Confederates. There wouldn't have been a Union prisoner war camp that day, realistically. But it doesn't matter. He goes there, and to Dave's point earlier, he's got a real knack with medicine for whatever reason. I mean, as, as a child, he would, he would restore animals to health when he was a kid, and he ended up helping a lot with the Confederate wounded. And he ends up meeting a woman named Margaret Branson. And this is a woman who's from Baltimore, and she's a lot like a lot of civilians. They came down to the area to help the Confederates. And she um she takes a shine to, to Powell, and he's gonna ultimately get transferred to a hospital, a prisoner war camp in Baltimore. There's that great story about how she snuck him out of prison. Who knows if that's true? If they put the the, the yeah. file he money escaped to with air quotes. He escaped. <laughs> but, but is that story she she bribed the guard with? Yeah, she, she brought him a cloak and brought a cake with a ten dollar <laughs> note in it, and that he used the cloak and the ten dollars to bribe his way out. And it's a great story if that's the case. Yeah. But regardless, he he does get out, um, and she does help him escape. That's the she ends up living um, in it's it's I think it's sixteen Utah Street, which is mm-hmm. the same road that Camden Yards is on, Mary. By the way, where the Orioles play, just a little bit north of the nice. ballpark. And there's a boarding house there, and he's going to ultimately end up end up going back to the Confederate Army. He joins Mosby's Rangers, um, winter of 1863, give or take, in that ballpark. But he's a guy who's got – he's young, but he's got a lot of fighting experience, and he's somebody who's a capital C Confederate in the, in, in the war. He also survived being kicked by a mule. Right in the face. Yeah. When he was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> so he's good with animals, but just don't get behind. That's how he learned to be good with animals. Like, One mistake. Then you exactly. learn, don't go behind the mule near the legs. <laughs> yeah. But it's funny because, you know, he ends up, you know, um, staying with the early 1865. And he, he ends up leaving his union. What's interesting about him, though, is he's very loyal to the Confederates. But he also walks on his union. And he actually takes the oath of, of allegiance to the union. And goes back to Baltimore. He ends up back at, at Brant's boarding house, pro- early 1865. And this is probably when he met John Wilkes Booth. Realistically, was up there in Baltimore. And it, there's connections where you know he was working at a place in, I believe, it was a china shop he was working at. So mm-hmm. you could literally say he was a bull in a china shop, Mary. You could literally use that quote to describe him. So bad. And, and, <laughs> and there's, and, and there's we'll a just story with that one out. Oh, thank you so much. Anyway. Um, <laughs> You know, you know my little derringer is what i need for you here. you know <laughs> yeah. but 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 the reality was that alleged that little shop was a stop on the confederate railroad and that's where john surratt would have met up with him and, and that's a place where he probably would have ended up getting brought into the plot realistically and this is this is january 65 and like you said you know at that point he's already assumed his his alias so in that period of time between when he escaped uh, you know, after Gettysburg and before he went back and joined uh, Colonel Mosby's Rangers, you know, he spent some time in Warrington, Fauquier County, Virginia, in a family by the name of uh, the Payne family. And so he's kind of like hanging out with them, uh, befriending them. And there's there's a I think the guy who's in charge of the home is John Payne. And he's got like a nephew whose name is Lewis Payne. And then kind of from then on, whenever uh, Powell got in trouble, that's when he started using this alias. He kind of stole this kid's identity, which is, uh, I don't know if that's a very classy thing to do, but that's when he, you know, he signs his oath of allegiance, like you talked about. He, he does L. Payne and stuff like that. And so that's that's why, you know, in all the books and everything after the assassination, you know, his identity, he was the mystery man. He really was. And there's a great book by author Betty Owensby uh, that's uh, called Alias Payne, uh, Lewis Thornton Powell, The Mystery Man with Lincoln Conspiracy. And uh, because really no one knew who he was. I mean, because he, even after the arrest, you know, he wasn't talking to the authorities. He barely told his lawyer his lawyer took two weeks through you know the trial been going for two weeks before finally powell tells his lawyer his real name and where his family is and everything like that down in florida and so he really was like like you said Darren, he was a confederate kind of through and through and he he entered this plot of booths with this this soldier's mentality that you know and, and you know we talk about I, I i don't know if we'll get to the end of them you know the last words of of Powell when they're putting the, the execution hood and the noose around his neck and they, you know, the, the executioner is saying, I hope you die quick pain. Even then, you know, they still call him pain because they don't know any better. He says, you know, best captain. And he still has that, you know, that military, you know, that, that soldierly look about it. And that's what he followed Booth as the same way he saw Booth as a superior. And this was a cause 
for he, it was played to him as a cause that would benefit the Confederacy. And this was something that he joined first to kidnap. And then even when it sh- switched to assassination, you don't question your orders. You know, once you've decided, you know, you do what is just told to you and Powell, you know, that's what happened to him. Yeah, he was definitely huge, Booth's no. best soldier, no question. It was what was interesting about Powell, too. He showed some cracks in the armor. There's that story where he kind of saved some Union soldiers when he was part of Mosby's Parson yeah. Rangers, protect them from a farm they just pillage. And, and, and so he's an interesting cat in a lot of different ways, but he's certainly somebody who was clearly the he was Booth's muscle and he knew that he was going to be the most loyal guy. He had to have been realistically the only guy Booth probably 100% trusted in the entire thing. And and that's kind of worth the way it went through. But he, you know, to your point, you know, you know, best captain. That was um, he was he was a soldier. That's what he was. Yeah, and and I think that's the huge difference between him and someone like Atzerat. Atzerat, you know, when it came down to it, wasn't about to follow an order that was to murder somebody. And Powell, you know, having been a soldier, was. And and that was the defense, you know, a Powell's defense attorney, his closing arguments, you know, there wasn't much hope for Powell. I mean, he he stabbed the Secretary of State, you know, in the face and he, you know, broke Frederick Seward's head, you know, a piece of his skull popped out with his with his with his gun and stabbed, you know, a bunch of other people. There wasn't much hope, but that is what the defense attorney um you know, William Doster said, he said he, that it was the South that had turned him into a killer. You know, that it was the war, mm-hmm. it was slavery, it was being a Confederate that, you know, you can't blame him for doing what he did because he had been trained, you know, since through the war to become this, this machine. And Booth just became just the, the gave him the direction, you know, that he required. And so <laughs> it was a, a good attempt to kind of condemn to save his client, to condemn the Confederacy in general in the South and the the whole you know environment that Powell grew up in to try to save him. Um, but yeah, exactly as Darren said, he was the muscle. And you know, you said he trusted him the most when they get to Surratt, you know, when Booth and Harold get to Surratt Tavern and are talking to John M. Lloyd and get their thing. And before they leave, what do they say? They say, uh, I have some news if you want to hear it. And Lloyd says, whatever, <laughs> you know, tell me if you want. And Booth says, I'm pretty sure we have assassinated Lincoln and Secretary Seward. There was no, even though Seward survived, Booth was confident and he didn't say the vice president, which I think is very telling that he had no, because if Davey, whether he knew or not that George didn't go through with it, Booth wasn't ready to brag that they killed the vice president because he wasn't sure. But when it came to Powell, he knew he could trust Powell to get the job done. And it was only by a miracle that that he didn't kill Secretary mm-hmm. Seward. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, you know, at the trial, they, they you know, his attorneys are going to try to soften him a little bit without much like this story allegedly Paul wanted to you know apologize to Seward for what he did and he tried to say that everything against Mary Surratt she was innocent and by then the die was cast with that and so he was he was somebody he was you know if you don't want to say he was a robot but he was a he was a trained killer and he was somebody who unfortunately if you're going to do a plot like this you have to have a guy like that there's no question and the interesting thing too um is i think when booth read the papers and read about seward's sons what had happened to him he was appalled by it he was like this is not what i asked him to do yeah asked, da- davy asked, said yeah he felt bad about the sons yeah, i asked him to go after just just secretary of state not his kid well, well you mentioned before about how he was talking to lloyd down at down at Surrattsville. was there's those stories where they weren't even sure how the heck the secession was supposed to go like if you kill the vice president, it's not like it is now, you know, the president pro tem, the Senate's the guy who's supposed to take over, you know, a guy named Lafayette Foster was the guy who would have taken over, mm-hmm. but they didn't even know. And there's that story of Booth was kind of asking well, a friend of his, like, so not for nothing, but um, who follows him? And the guy just started laughing after a while. He's like, he doesn't, you'll never get that. You'll government. never get that far, <laughs> you know, but, um, but it goes to show. And it, if, if you can probably see that once Richmond fell, you can see Booth snapped and decided he was going to, to your point, just out of vanity and to do the whole thing. But um, but you know, we'll, 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 before we get to Mary, it's funny talking about the, the kidnapping plot of how silly the whole thing got to. You know, the, this the, my favorite story is the one how they were gonna they were gonna shut the lights off and throw Lincoln off the balcony and oh, at Fort Theater, on, and he was yeah. gonna come right back like, on again. David Blaine, it he's gone. <laughs> it's like he's gone. Man. Copperfield, where'd he go? Where'd he go? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because it, uh, allegedly, Ed, you know, Edward Spangler was the guy who was put, put, put the lights out, right? Uh, sense, that's what they know, wanted to accuse right. him of, but and I then, don't. And then, and there's that there's that story where when the actual assassination happens, allegedly he couldn't get to the light, and then you had peanuts holding the horse, and it, it it's so funny because it it turned it turned into a, a Keystone Cops of who was supposed to do what at the end with the whole thing, and, and when you when you read the the, the accounts of. 
that you could you could read five different sources and they're all five different stories. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're all George Atzerodt. You know, I've, yeah. I've said many times, P- Peanuts got screwed. I've been saying that my, my whole life. Because <laughs> he got kicked and hit with a knife? <laughs> he, he, got, he got beaten up. He's a sort of poor little guy holding the horse. And he, <laughs> gets, he gets beaten up. But um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of that, though. But but Powell's certainly somebody who, you know, he you know he was a soldier right up until the end. And to your point, he says, you know, you know, best captain. He, you know, he, 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 he knew he was his, his, he knew his fate the entire time of the trial. And I thought Norman Reedus did a great job blowing him in the movie too, by the way. Yeah. I he, um, so too. Didn't have a good lot of lines. I wish he had yeah. more. <laughs> he certainly had that. Um, he certainly had the mentality. Well, but the, we also know. Oh, go ahead, Mary. Oh, I was going to say the, the thing I remember about Powell again, going back to the killing Lincoln documentary is just when he, they're sitting in that hotel room, the initial meeting and he's like, it's pain. I ain't going by Powell no more. And then Bruce oh. is like, could you get it straight? And then they go, they go back to when he's in the shooting gallery and he's like, it's Powell or whatever. He, he says the reverse and the look on Booth's face, he just rolls his eyes. It's like, could we not just, could you, you, you pick one? It yeah. must've just been for the audience benefit to know who this guy I is. Know, had to throw it in twice. That's what I'm thinking. It's like, but just like Booth, like the, the guy who played Booth, his reaction, he's just rolling his eyes. Like, okay, could you, could we not keep changing the alias that you have? Because if we get questioned. Well, and he did, because I mean, when he first, you know, came to this rap boarding house, he decided to pretend to be a Baptist preacher named Wood. And I mean, his dad was a Baptist preacher, you know, so it wasn't a bad alias because he knew from his father, you know, what that would look like. But I remember Anna Surratt or a Nora Fitzpatrick, one of them be like, well, that he'd make a queer preacher. I don't know if he's going to convert a lot of souls because he just <laughs> seemed so out of place. And, you know, and nowadays Powell is the, is the poster child. I mean, you show pictures of Lewis Powell to people like I, I show it to them and he is, it looks like he's, I mean, he was a handsome man. I mean, you talk about Booth being the handsomest man in America, but if you put Lewis Powell next to him, I mean, I'm okay saying that Lewis Powell was one handsome dude. And that is, he looks like a Calvin Klein model in his well, mugshot yeah, the, photographs. The colorized photos of him. He's yeah. Is, isn't he, is he the youngest? Yes. He, Cause I think he has his 21st birthday in prison. Yep. Around he was born that, 18, he's born 1844, right? Yeah, so, so put him in 2021, yeah. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And he, I mean, he, you know, we talk about, he's not one dimensional, just a soldier. The stories about, like you said, him taking care of animals, being, you know, you know, he had, his family had good memories of him. But at the same time, there were those aspects of rage. At one time, he, he got arrested for beating a black servant half to death mm-hmm. for disobeying him. Yeah. And so that plays, I mean, it plays a role that these, these are complicated people who, you know, can both be, you know, as you said, he, even before going to the gallows was trying to defend Mary. There's that, there was that, you know, that trying to defend a woman. He, he protected some union soldiers who had surrendered to him and people were trying to kill them. And he stood up for them and said, no, you will not kill these men. So there's this very conflicted, just like everybody where you have all these layers and it's hard to just judge him as one thing or another. And we shouldn't because he was a rounded individual with both a lot of positive attributes and obviously a lot of negative attributes Mm -hmm. as well. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a good well, segue into our last conspirator. We got to talk about, about. We got to talk about our girl Mary now. Mary Surratt <laughs> drinking from the Mary mug. Yep. <laughs> we got to do it. You got to do it. So, so you know, Mary Mary Surratt's story. You know, Mary Jenkins. She's she's somebody who you know we, we you could do a whole episode on just her. I mean, she's 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 the enigma. She's the whole thing. Um, and she's somebody out of all the people back then and now. It's it's really a polarizing type of person. You know, whether it's it's you hate, you feel for or you hate her or you know there's just doesn't seem to be much in between you know staunch southern supporter um you know she ran the confederate underground out of her home in Surrattsville. now she, the thing about mary though was that you know she she was widowed at a young age and she was a strong businesswoman for someone of that period i mean she was you know people you had collectors coming to her at, at the property trying to take advantage of her and she wasn't having it um I always like the fact that she grew up on Andrews Air Force Base. I was going to get out of that story. That is it's cool. just an it's just an irony that that her family grew up on the land that would become Andrews Air Force Base. And I think she you know? gets her independence from the fact that her father dies at a young age, and her mother has to. Right. She's got to take over this plantation and manage the farm, manage the slaves, and she does it quite well. And she manages to increase the you know the finances that she has. So she's got this really good figure. But the interesting thing about it is you know at the end of the story her mother never has anything to say about the ex yeah, her mother out out lives her and we have no, yeah, no 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 documents of her what she said about what happened to her daughter exactly but you can see how she's she's influenced by her because i've always seen mary surratt as being somebody who 
you know, she goes through hell with her, her husband, John senior, who is, you know, he's an alcoholic by like 1861. Um, and I think he passes away 1862. You know, she's got to become this, she's got to, she's got her three kids, but she's also, as she's, as they're growing up with this, she's got to protect them um, in any way she can from, from who he is with, with the tavern. And he, he's clearly drinking quite a bit. So I, I see her as being a very independent, strong female figure. You know, again, it goes back to the other conspirators in this, like, what do they have in this? Like, what, what's their stake in this? And hers is, is the boarding house that, that she has, which is where they're all gathering, you know? Well, I mean, that, that's where John, you know, he ends up, you know, becoming, you know, running, you know, smuggling up and down from, from that area. It's, a, you know, obviously a hotbed of Confederate activity. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because she, she moves the family to Washington, D.C. to get away from that whole element. They end up buying the place over there right behind you. You can see her waving from the window, actually, if you look close, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and, and so, um, you know, this is, this, is a, this is, a you know, a person who, I guess she was, you know, quite industrious. But again, she had, she had a little controversy. She had a little trouble with that priest. There was rumors that talked yeah. about with him and who else was sent up to Boston, by the way. You know, oh, Father Fanati came up by you? Father Fanati, he, he was sent to Boston. Usually yes. they get sent out of here to somewhere else. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but, 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 no, they were just friends, Darren. Oh, Let's I, I, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. He needed a confidant. Her husband yeah. was train wreck. <laughs> no question about it. And, you know, but again, I, th I think, you know, she was focused on protecting John, protecting Anna, yeah. and her, Isaac, her other son, was fighting for the Confederacy, and he went, went and never saw him again. He ended up living, but, you know, never got back to it. But again, you know, he, you know, it, her situation is one that she's, probably, you know, very a strong Confederate of that area, there's no question about it. And she ends up getting pulled into the entire thing because, you know, she ends up hosting that, having the property, which takes it right behind you, which ends up being the nest that has the you know, egg roll. That phrase, the, 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 yeah. Yeah, according to <laughs> the egg roll. You got it. That, that's the pun the I tell on the booth, on the booth for. Yeah. <laughs> the, nowadays, with the Chinese restaurant, it's the nest that hatched the egg roll. You got so it. So someday the three of us have to go take a picture outside that restaurant and put that in the caption on Twitter or something like that. That's right. <laughs> you know, so, so I know you've done a lot of background on Mary back, you know, specifically when she was young. Um, so, how do you think her? mindset was growing up specifically from going from maryland into washington dc and probably her mindset when she got to dc i mean i think she i mean she is you know southern maryland like born and bred and it, we, we undercut like maryland you know maryland has a very complex history when it comes to civil war being a border state and just being so reliant on on slavery and how it essentially was forced to stay in the union by military you know by military act when the secession crisis began and so mary is very much a confederate sympathizer there's no doubt about it i mean we can mm -hmm. try to you know it, it's it's hard for us i know sometimes especially some of mary's defenders talk about you know she couldn't be capable of some of these things because let's look at how deeply religious she was which she absolutely was she was you know she was she converted to catholicism and you know she was very religious and went to church all the time and but that you know, as we know, sometimes even the most, sometimes the people who proclaim to be the most religious can be, in my mind, sometimes the most sinful. But she had that, you know, that same thing of being supportive of, you know, slavery. She saw it as a way of life that, you know, needed to continue. She had slaves of her own, um, even though because of financial circumstances, she was more renting uh, enslaved people from her neighbors. But, um, and, you know, she had a rough time after her husband drank himself to death and, you know, was in so much debt that that's why she moved to that DC property. And then living there, I'm, she moved there, I think, partly to help her children. But at that point, John Stratt was already in it. I mean, he was already, he had taken over as postmaster after his father died. And even after they lost the postmaster position, he was then doing, that's when he stopped being a agent in a set place and started being a courier. And it's hard to believe, especially during the period of time when he was postmaster before it was revoked from him. And then afterward that she wasn't aware of some things that he was doing. And that's where the big question of how much did she know? But once John Surratt brings John Wilkes Booth 
to her home, she does get roped in. And so I don't think it's that Booth, Booth never sought Mary out. You know, when we talk about these other conspirators, he saw these people out. You know, Davy, he brought him in. You know, Powell, he definitely sought him out. George was to help with this. Mary, I feel like, you know, that's why it's hard for, for people to, to believe in her guilt is because she's not like, you don't go being like, you know what I need on this A team? A widowed mother living in DC. That's what I need for this. Boarding house. It's a boarding house. That's what I need. No, it was just when John Surratt was no longer there because he's doing these courier activities for the Confederacy and Booth is still trying to keep his own kind of weird plan together. And Mary allows him to use that space and is his go between between John Surratt and himself. That's what gets her into this. And she was never going to play an active role. She just kind of got one because she had to play that middleman. And that's what kind of works against her. I mean, a lot works against her too, because you have people like Sarah Slater of that place all the time. She was always yeah. there. Um, and so she, well, I, I always go back to the fact that it's like, well, if, if I was going to have a really, if I was going to do a really bad crime, would I tell my friend's mother? You know, that, 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 that's where I always kind of fall back on too. Um, but again, she clearly knew about the kidnapping plot. She had to have, mm-hmm. you know, um, and whether or not she knew about the assassination, it's it's tough to say. I think I think that the most damning, the two damning pieces against Mary, if we're gonna go, if we're gonna go try to damn her, was the fact that she had allegedly reserved a room for Powell at the Herndon House in March. She had she was part of that. And the the, the smooth story is the one that gets you. That's the one mm-hmm. that gets her right. So the story where the night of the assassination, Richard Smooth was the guy who owned the boat down at Port Tobacco. I guess uh, Sarah had only paid for half of it because that's what he was going to do. So if you're going to take off, you only pay half. You might as well save some money. Yeah. So he um, he comes knocking on the door the night of the assassination looking for the money. And I guess Mary is like, you need to go because they're going to use it today. And I don't think that's, I could be wrong, but I don't think that, that story came out till after. Yes, yeah, so it was quite a bit after that Smoot right. um, finally told that story. Yeah. So, so that adds a little bit of credence to the fact that she knew something was going down that night whether or not it was the assassination or not. And then there's a story, the Whiteman story about like you referenced earlier about when they were coming back from, you know, from, um, from Clinton or Surrattsville that, you know, all this happiness will be turning to gloom. And she was asking about when the soldiers sentries leave their post. And there's, there's all those little stories that, that again, it's all hearsay, but if, if I'm going to sit and I'm going to sit here and say, well, if I'm going to hang my hat on Mary being guilty, it's the smooth story. Cause that's the one that there's really no explanation for yeah, that she that she used those words. And, and and that's the thing with Mary. It's funny how we have all these small pieces. And, you know, the biggest, you know, the problem about Mary is that you have the, the witnesses where we really put the evidence on are unreliable witnesses. Absolutely. Like I'm I tend to believe most of what Lewis Weichmann says on the stand, you know, the border who testified about Booth being there. And because we, we have other witnesses who verified that um, and that, you know, he would have conversations with Mary when John Surratt was out and things like that. And I tend to also believe John M. Lloyd at, at Sarasville Tavern, who's, you know, when he says that when Mary came that day that she told him to have the shooting irons ready, someone's going to call for them tonight. And so it, it's, but they are, those witnesses also, we have to question them because they, I mean, Lloyd is told the night of the assassination, I think we just shot Lincoln and we killed the secretary of state. And then Lloyd goes to sleep, you know, he's just like, all right, well, have fun with that. Bye. <laughs> And, you know, Weichman, as Mary alluded to earlier with Davy Harold, is the kid who wants to be involved and and Booth manipulates him, too. He gets Weichman wrapped in this as well, like doing hop, you know, things for him, you know, telling. I think there's a telegram that John Wilkes Booth sends to Lewis Weichman saying, give me the, the address of Powell, you know, at the Herndon House or whatever you're saying that he, Booth is trying to wrap him into this as well. And that's where it gets complicated. Where do we put our trust when we have these pretty damning statements from these guys? But they themselves are also very questionable. Yeah, I mean, the Lloyd story, I mean, because it took him a little bit of time to come around in that story. I think he had a little time in Capitol Prison. Then he finally woke up and said, well, I better tell this story. Yeah. And um, so, again, a lot of this it goes back to covering your own skin with a lot of this stuff. Um, and, and my whole thing with her was there's no way she's completely innocent. It's just it's just you have to be you have to be, you have to really, really, really stretch it out. You know, my Mary Sirach glass notwithstanding. She clearly knew something, whether or not she knew about the assassination. Is it possible she still thought there could have been some sort of kidnapping plot? I suppose they had nowhere to take him, though. That's the other right. thing, too. Yeah. You know, he was, you know, 
Booth was talking a lot about how Joseph Johnson was going to be going to the mountains and he was going to be living, fighting the guerrilla war. And maybe he was going to take him there. And who knows? Maybe they're going to go to Eden, Oklahoma. Maybe who knows? Popular place. Exactly. We're going to hit Granberry first. I'm going to go to Eden. We'll, we'll, yep. we'll get you there. But I, but I think, you know, you wonder too, because, you know, how much, you know, John was, was he, John Surratt, I mean, was he ever going, were they holding her basically bait for John to come back to? But then there was, there was, but then there was, but then there was, you know, these reports that John Surratt was seen in Washington that night too, which ended up not being true. So you wonder how much, how much they really knew. The night of of the 14th of April, I always equated to what what 9-11 was like here, where all these rumors, all these stories, you know, you're hearing horses running through the streets as rumors, there's the Confederate cavalry and you know, go coming back. And so you can imagine that the sheer mayhem and all the stories that came out of that and all the different urban legends that we still deal with today. I, I do think, you know, she was kind of held for like to, to bring her son out of where he was, which was in Canada. <laughs> Those darn Canadians. Up, yep. up, up in, in Montreal and he never shows up. I think that was definitely a part of it, but also they had enough to hold her. I think they wanted him. Absolutely. They wanted John Surratt, but it wasn't, you know, that that sometimes I feel like people, and not that you were doing it, but there are some people make the argument that, oh, Mary's innocent. They just wanted John. I'll be like, well, they wanted John, but also look at what they had on her. Look what they had on her. her, But they also wanted John. And I think they were playing into that, like, oh, he's her son. So he's going to come be the good son and, and save her. I'm not sure if he could have, though, to be honest. No. I, I think if John would have, John Surratt would have come back, I think they would have added him to add a chair. I but then so. I think they still would have the evidence against Mary. And maybe maybe just because they were maybe might get worried about doing, you know, executing a woman. But really, I always look at, too, like Mary was to, to in their eyes. Mary was guilty. Like, really, I mean, you look at the final votes, you know, they, I mean, we don't have the exact vote counts, but they found her guilty and they found a two thirds majority decided that she should be executed. And yes, you have a clemency plea where they say, you know, but the clemency plea isn't, we think she's innocent. It's she's guilty. We have established beyond a reasonable doubt that she's guilty and not only guilty, but deserving to be executed. So you voted twice for each one of the conspirators when they were deciding the first, the sentencing, uh, the uh, sentencing, uh, the, the guilt and then sentencing, they did two votes for each conspirator. Are they guilty? You just needed a majority vote to be found guilty. And then Mm -hmm. should they be executed? Then you needed two thirds. So we don't know exact vote counts, but still she was found guilty and enough people, at least six out of the nine commissioners says she should be executed based on the evidence. And then even though five of them wrote, I think it was five, wrote a clemency plea. It wasn't because we think she's innocent. It's because she's a woman and her age. It was more chivalry that made them do it. Not any question of her guilt. And it really up until the point where she was hanging by the end of that rope, People were calling, they were saying, look at this evidence. It was only because, and it's interesting how that plays into the dynamic of Victorian womanhood and masculinity and chivalry and stuff like that, how she was capable of it all during the trial when we have all this evidence. But then the second we punish her in the same way that we would punish a man for this, then we have done something wrong, that there's something wrong with society. She is a woman. How could we have done that? And it's interesting how it plays into just these bigger ideas. Well, I think it's the the PR because it went from, hang her to oh my god we can't possibly hang her almost yeah. overnight mm-hmm. right yeah. and you look at the nine guys hunter and coats and how and aiken and clinton and wallace and foster and tompkins and harris all the wow. nine of them right wow way <laughs> to go <laughs> buddy right so i could not do that if you asked me to <laughs> so, so if you have nine of them you probably had six was going to hang because it's majority you know it was two thirds and five so you have to wonder out of the five people who probably you have, you have no idea who the five were who were looking for clemency. No, no, we know. We know the five who signed it. We do? Yeah, the because Clem- the clemency plea was signed by five of them. I don't know at the top of my head who they were, but we don't oh, okay. know. And that's the thing. You needed at least two thirds. They all could have voted to execute her, you know, and yeah, we true. just don't know. And just it just had to be at least six out of the nine. But to even be the eligible. executioner said that he just put five knots in because right. he, didn't, he didn't think that she was going to be executed. And, and you have those the same ideas of chivalry. That's why, exactly. And like Lewis Powell, we talked about him saying, you know, Mary Surratt had nothing to do with it. That is an example of that that chivalry, because I tell you right now, Davy Harold said she's in deep in it as the rest of us. 
So, you know, sometimes people like to point out, be like, well, look, Lewis Powell, he on the, on the you know, at the scaffold said she was innocent. Davy was complaining at one point during the trial when she was getting sympathetic treatment. He was like, that old lady was in it as deep as the rest of us. So, you know, the idea of Davy, I, I can believe that because he definitely doesn't take me as the one to be the chivalrous type while Powell could be. And so it's just, that's why Mary's so interesting because you have, you know, it's like a coin flip about how much did she know? Darren, I agree. Definitely not completely innocent. No way. Knew something was going to happen. Enough evidence that something's going to happen. And I think based on the evidence they had, even though there's questionable nature, when it comes down to what the verdicts were, even though I disagree with the death penalty, I, I'm very much against it in practice, even historically and stuff like that. When you look at what they did for these people on trial, the four we've talked about tonight, the evidence is that they knew about the assassination before it happened and did nothing to stop it. And that's what that earned them the noose as opposed to, oh, sorry, my phone's making noises. Okay. Um, as opposed to the other four who they couldn't prove that. They may knew about the abduction and stuff like that. And so whether or not it was fair to execute them is a subject of debate. But I think as kangaroo courty as the military commission was, they were as fair as they could possibly be when it came to doling out punishments based on the evidence. Yeah. And the litmus test, test to your point was whether or not you knew about the assassination or not. Right. Um, and so, you, 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 and so it does, you, you, you know, you can kind of expand this thing. I know we're not going to talk about more people, but you look at, you know, John Lloyd knew after the fact, certainly, um, you know, guys oh, like the people Tom, who helped right? Bruce. Yeah. On the escape. But guys, but guys yeah. like Tom, Thomas Jones, guys like that. Right. Yeah. They clearly knew it because he was, you know, in the pint thicket bringing food, you know. So you wonder where they drew the line because they could have thrown a big net if they really, really wanted to. And they claimed they were going, I mean, they arrested all of those people and they were on the wanted poster. It says, you know, death to anyone who aids in the beds and stuff like that. Yeah. So they threatened that. But I think in reality, they realized, first of all, we can't do that. Like, I mean, can you really get away from us? Like, you know, executing just, I mean, Thomas Jones helped a little bit, but you know, all these little people along the way, you know, can we get away with it? And even mud, you know, people like to be like, well, look what they did to Dr. Mud. I'd be like, yeah, but look what Dr. Mud did. I know we're not talking about him, but look what Dr. Mud did uh, in the months before. That's why he doesn't fall in the same category as Thomas Jones. Cause yeah, did he aid in a bed after he sure did, but did he also help with the preparations? He absolutely did. Exactly. Well, you, well, you can make a case for Samuel Mudd that he knew that there was something going on before the, but you, you could, it's, it's pretty, pretty unreasonable to think he knew about the assassination in real oh, time. Oh, I agree. Right. So absolutely. He, so in his mind, I, I don't buy the fact that he heard a knock on the door and he's because of his, his oath, he had to, I don't buy it. He think he knew who it was, but he probably didn't know what Booth had done. Sure. But he also absolutely. got him the hell out of Dodge pretty quick too. Yeah, exactly. yeah. He sent him on, he sent him on his way. Yeah. You know, sent him off with Harold. So he knew he must have been something. That the, and then he uh, lied to the authorities, which is what did him in. His own yeah. lawyer said if they would, he, he denied knowing Booth. And then, you know, it wasn't until after he was arrested. He's like, oh, yeah, no, I know John Wilkes Booth. It's like, dude, what did you think was going to happen? <laughs> them to, like, it, yeah. Wasn't he the reason like Sarai Yes. Booth? <laughs> if people who <laughs> love Mudd. Mary, you should hate Dr. Mudd. Because if Dr. Mm -hmm. Mudd didn't exist, Mary would have been alive. Nothing no, bad would have like, happened I to don't, her. I've never been a fan of Dr. Mudd. <laughs> <laughs> But the mud house is great. Go visit his house. Oh, I know. The mud mm -hmm. house is great. <laughs> and growing up, all I heard from my grandmother was, if you do that, your name will be mud. Yeah. So it was not really connected. It's apparently not connected with him. It is now. That's the way yeah, I see it. He told it's me it was, but I'm like, why do you keep saying that? She's it like, is now the same way. It's the same way Hooker is with Joe Hooker now. It's the same deal. It, yeah, it's, exactly. It, it, exactly. It is now. Now you can say yeah. But that's Hooker what my grandma so always much. told me was it was Dr. Mudd. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I'm glad that that made its way up to and like, I can't say I've ever heard anyone use it in real life other than like when I'm talking about this stuff. So that's Oh, great. my grandma used it with me all the time. Like if I was that's doing awesome. something that could potentially get me into trouble, she was like, you keep doing that. Your name will be Mud. And I'm like, who, who's mud? And she You're just like, like squishy doctor. dirt. And she's like, no, Dr. Mud. And I'm like, oh, okay. No, it's an interesting area. He's, he's, he's a kind of a cool grave to visit too. When you go oh, absolutely. To yeah. church. At the church where he met him, where he met yeah. Booth. No, it's, it's interesting. It's like that whole area is really, really neat down there. But I, but I think the, the whole sordid tale is interesting though. Um, you know, the, the movie we referenced earlier, uh, that was kind of, based on Larson's book there um, is interesting too. the conspirator because in, in, we'll have her on for the book club, David, I think hopefully you're going to join us. Yeah, be a definitely. Great time, you know, but I think it, it really, it, it, it does show. And I think everybody should, who studies this should see the movie. It's not the mm -hmm. most thrilling movie of all time. I love that movie, but it's, it's a good, it's a good movie. If you're into this, it's a good yes. courtroom drama. Yeah. But I mean, if you know, 
there aren't too many 16 year old kids who go on a seat, sit down and love this one. It's just a dry movie. Totally but movie. of course I'm like this the whole time, you know, mm-hmm. you know I will like, say, oh. and I think Kate Cover Larson brings it up too. Is this like in the movie, Frederick Aiken, you know, who's played by uh, James McAvoy, you know, yeah. it's all about, it's, it's about him, you know, more so than, I mean, it's about Mary, but it's mostly about him and yeah. they make him seem really good. He was the worst attorney there. Oh, I mean, I, I did so it. He was really bad in questioning and doing this thing. He was kind of a rookie. He was asking questions he didn't know the answers to and just like calling witnesses that were not relevant, not a good attorney, but in the movie, you know, just like Hollywood magic. Well, it's James McAvoy. Yeah, I'm looking at him fighting for justice in you know, this system. And my only critique is that, I understand the criticisms that you put toward, you know, that people put toward Edwin Stanton and just the entire commission and everything like that. And I'm not saying that Stanton didn't wasn't involved in the the goings on of the court and stuff like that. But I shy away from people who really dislike Stanton because it puts because not because I don't I don't really care for him, but only because it puts all of the badness on one man, which I don't think is fair. Like I don't really care for Stanton Stan. here, just to let you. Know. Well, well no, no, I don't just, just. Yeah, go ahead. There's way more in this, and it's mostly because of the war aspect of it all too. Yeah, I mean, just the, he manipulated Lincoln, him and Halleck, and that's the different different podcast. Um, the only problem I had with this one was Kevin Klein playing him. By the way, I you didn't like him. One, I thought he did I didn't, good. I didn't. I will watch I Kevin Klein in anything. Oh, me I, too. I, I thought he did him, great, yeah. but yeah. he was he was a little too fish called wand, a little too dazed for me. It was just, it was, I, I like him, but I thought John. You wanted a little more Wild Wild West? John Goodman would have oh, been Oh, I loved him in Wild Wild West. Wild Wild West. So you know, yes. That was pretty yes. good. <laughs> Although, ever, ever Rachel Ward, I'll watch that. I'll watch her with the phone book. I'll knock a lot. <laughs> but, but, you know. Oh, man. She was good. She was really good, too. And you can't hit Milton from Office Space playing. Uh, playing yeah, John right, John Lloyd. Well, it's too you bad gotta, you couldn't have had the Stanton from uh, the National Geographic documentary Killing Lincoln. He did yeah, a good job. Like, that movie was spot on cast that's another one that we've like i've mentioned a couple times in this it's oh, it's great not really connected with the bill o'reilly I, I, as i i remember as yeah talking I'm about to, yeah. to talk about that it is an they episode. did not use bill o'reilly's book at all to do exactly. it which is why it's it great so good and people i've had people like i don't want to watch it because i think it's bill it's not bill o'reilly it is right it's, they used the gentleman who wrote the book John Wilkes Booth Day by Day. His name was Art Lukes, and he yeah. was the one who did it. And his book is great, and that's why the, the documentary is wonderful. Yeah, it, it is poorly really named, good. but wonderful. Exactly, it is so good. And I thought, I don't know, I thought like the guy that played Booth did really good, and I thought like Billy Campbell, who was Lincoln, was was great too. Like I thought it, it was so well cast and so mm-hmm. well done. And it's another one next to the conspirator that I would, after you've listened to this episode, watch them both. Mm-hmm. That's right. Well, it was interesting. All four of these people we talked about, you know, they all go to the gallows July 8th, 1865. So seventh. Seventh, right. What's, what's July 8th? There was something. Oh. Was July, something Probably something, something Civil something. War. <laughs> Probably. Civil War. July 7th, 1865, 1865. They all go to the gallows, and it's almost like they're all going on a different path, right? And, you know, you know, Mary, you know, the, the whole don't let me fall line, mm-hmm. you know, have the whole, to your point about the whole uh, – with Powell's Powell. you know, the captain, you know, thing. best captain, you know, best captain. And it, it, the sad part about Powell is, um, is he didn't die too quick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it took he what, didn't. seven, eight minutes to die, yep. you know? And yeah. so, but it, it, you, you make sure you, you wonder at all four of these guys, what went through their minds at the very end, if they realized if they followed just a false leader and went down, went down the wrong road, you know, cause like we said before, these aren't people who were just, hired guns these are people who all had their own lives and i think i think as people study them individually what's great about talking about them is it it human you know humanizes them a little bit it shines light on them because when you talk about the lincoln conspiracy of course you're going to talk about booth and that's all you most people are going to talk about but the people who helped and and embedded him along the way all have their own stories and i think people don't realize that there's good stories to tell yeah and i think it's about you know you watch documentaries about it on tv and they really make them into villains and stuff and like what they did was wrong but you know it's about the lives that they had before to what led them to this you know we're talking about george atzerott who had a, you know at the time edith probably would have been about three or four years old you know these are sons their fathers their their siblings, mothers people exactly mothers who are you know, ultimately in the end, trying to protect their children, you know, Mary probably was trying to protect John in some way. And I think when you look at these people and you humanize them, it's going to help you understand the whole Lincoln uh, conspiracy 
a little bit more and and the history behind it. Yeah, because Booth, you know, he's the villain and he should be. He deserves yeah. to be the villain. And even though he's interesting, has his own stuff and we can yeah. talk about him. But I kind of prefer the conspirators because um, they speak more to us as everyday individuals and the path that we can choose that we can make seemingly for good reasons for you know for a cause we believed in in the terms of lewis powell for for money for some way to support our family in the case of like george astronaut for accepting you know finding a, a group of people who believe in you and trust you like davy harold or you know uh, you know mary the still you know why did she do it well she wanted to help her son help a cause and to what degree her guilt is there that you have good intentions i mean you know you say the the path to hell is paved in good intentions Intentions, but they are the cautionary tale. At Booth, you, it's hard to associate ourselves. We look at Booth and be like, I would never, I'm not a famous actor who goes nuts and shoots the president. Mm -hmm. But these individuals, they weren't crazy. You know, Booth wasn't either. But, you know, they were just normal people like you and me. And that is why most people don't like, in my mind, to study this stuff is because it's too close to home. It's easy to discount Booth and the conspirators as bad bad in every way, yeah. bad people who do bad things. And it makes us feel better as society to know there's the good and there's the bad. But we know it's not true. We know it's not. And this is an example of these are individuals who did bad things. Absolutely. They were they they took they took place in one of the took part in one of the greatest crimes in American history. And we still feel the repercussions today. But they weren't at inherently bad or evil people. Mm -hmm. It was the choices they made. And it's hard for people you know, a lot of times to judge that, especially when you have Lincoln on the other side, exactly. Lincoln, who we, and who we need to revere. Yeah. How he's been kind of like, you know, it, it, it's like he gets elevated in all this, which he, he probably was the greatest president. He was, Absolutely. Great, he, he was a great human, but at that, is it right that we take these people down into being just you know, the worst the to worst, balance it to, out to just, you know, there's these one dimensional figures who were, were absolute demons it's sometimes like they just appear on April 14th and they disappear when they're executed. Yeah. And I think to understand the full story, to understand even Lincoln's presidency, you have to study them as people as well and to understand what their motives were, why they did it. Even though we disagree with it, exactly. they made those choices exactly. and they made those we choices. have to learn from them and yeah. figure out why they did it. Otherwise, Lincoln's death is hollow. And that's my biggest thing I've always said whenever people ask why I study this, because it seems like it's the, it's the bad guy. It's the sad ending to Lincoln, you know, this, this, the great emancipator and everything. Why would you spend so much time on this? I'm just, because it gives meaning to Lincoln's death. Without it, when we just give him the caricatures of crazy Confederate actor and a bunch of bad people, then it's, it's hollow. It, it, his death means nothing at that point because it, it just shows just, you know, but when you put it in context of the greater picture, what motivated each of these people, it helps show his impact on everyone. Just even the nobodies like George Astrod or, you know, like David Harold, you know, it's like that Lincoln had such an impact on them that they would work towards this thing of killing him shows, you know, it, it explains Lincoln's importance in his own time, even from the people who hated him. And if we just discount Booth and the conspirators, we lose a central part of who Lincoln was in his own time. Exactly. No, 100% agree with that. Well, it, it's definitely, it's easier historically look at Booth as the Pascara the apostate right to look at that because you know what to, you know versus you know the plays he did you know where he played a different type of guy because you needed someone booth had it's a, the only guy who could kill a president like lincoln had to be the epitome of evil right in that that's the way the, the whole mindset goes and so you have to it's the, it's the seesaw it's got to be one or the other so it's yeah. easy i think conceptually in our minds to put your arms around it that way than to look at these people as complex individuals because it, it, when you humanize them, you want them to be anything but human. And I think that's why people don't like to study them, why people don't like to even say his name, mm -hmm. right? Because it's important to, to look at this because once we stop humanizing people, I'm not sure what, what, what we're all doing here. That's what, that's what we have to do. Yeah. It is a fear to see our, and I mean, there is a legitimate fear to see parts of ourselves in these figures mm -hmm. and that makes us uncomfortable. And so we refuse it by making them two dimensional, you know, just flat characters. But when you really look into it and not that it's not that you agree in anything, but when you see the human side of it, it's uncomfortable for us, but we need to, in all history to see, especially when we look at the villains, not because we agree with them, but to see what was the human, the human element that led them to what they did. Exactly. Well, I think it was a good discussion. We could drop it off here, I think. I yeah. think um, 
that, but it's a great talk to, to do all this stuff. And I could talk about this all night. It goes on. Oh, me on, too. On. But the <laughs> three of us can get together sometime and talk about this over like some drinks at the walk and roll. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And wow. Mary's going to show off her, uh, her karaoke skills. Oh yeah, oh. we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> that will be. I'll tell you right now, that'll be the worst disaster ever to happen on that building. Trust me. Wow, <laughs> rough. If that happens. You don't want that happening. Mary, you should slap him right. Is that a challenge? <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, about the worst thing ever to happen in that city. I'm telling you right now, she does. She does karaoke, but but I think uh, two of you I'm, islands in the stream. Anyway, <laughs> yep. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Oh, old school right there. Are those right. Songs, you know, back my parents' cars in the back <laughs> and see with the no seatbelts rolling around. Was, you know, but um, but but again, it's it's great to talk about this stuff too because you know what though, in, in normal lives, you know, we all have our own regular lives. We don't get to talk about this stuff. Yeah. You know, we just don't get a chance. We to get talk funny about looks it. when we do. Exactly. <laughs> what What do you think was going through George Atzerodt's mind? Sorry, sir. This is the Taco Bell drive-through. You know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think, but we, I think, I, I think you, you study the stuff and you get to learn a lot about it. And I think the more you study this, the more it gives you a greater, you, you learn about Lincoln more by studying this. Exactly. And that's the thing that I've come across is how much more you learn about Abraham Lincoln based on the Lincoln assassination. I think yeah. it's hand in hand. You can't tell the story of Lincoln without telling the story of Booth. I think you just have to do it. Yeah. And it factors into the story of the civil war as well. How divided the country was, how passionate some people were about the confederacy you know you look at john wilkes booth and he's somebody that you know the fall of richmond was probably what made him switch from kidnapping to assassination like well if i'm gonna watch my if i'm gonna watch my country die then by god the man that made it die is gonna go down with it too you mm -hmm. know i think that's how he felt about it and that and you know as you said dave the vanity behind it as well you know he was very disillusioned at that point and it all factors into the story that is the, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And you have to look at all of it. You'll never know what struggles they had to, what was going through their minds. Even Booth, for example, yep. of, of, of what, what he, he wrestled with. Um, but, but again, it's part of history and it's something everybody should study. Definitely should not be something to be afraid of. It's something to embrace and look at and, and get a better picture, a better appreciation for, uh, for the 16th president at, at minimum. No question. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, hey, Dave, thanks for jumping on with us. In the silly thanks podcast for letting ours. me join you. It yeah. was fun. Well, you're welcome awesome. back anytime. You're yeah, definitely welcome back anytime. Like, I think you'll probably be joining us again for another Sounds time. good. Yeah, we got we got four of the conspirators who are on exactly. that are on trial exactly. and one more who came later. So I'm just yeah, saying. Exactly. Yeah. We can, we, can, we can do the whole Michael Laughlin story next time. We'll go oh, next. it's fascinating. <laughs> you know he was a quilter? I'll tell you that next time. <laughs> Well, I think we definitely have to make that happen sometime. Oh, it'd be a lot of fun. No question about that. So anyway, so yeah. So anyway, thanks for joining us, Dave. It's been a great time. So this will drop on Saturday morning. Sweet. And um, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on Kate's book club. Yes, September. looking forward yeah. to talk about that. So now you got to read the book again. Yeah, and that's, I'm looking forward to having to read it again. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I love all of Kate Clifford Larson's books. So it's going to be great. Nice. She's great to do. So in any case, so we appreciate you doing it. This is a lot of fun. Mary, as always, the pleasure was all yours. Like I say all the time. And um, well, <laughs> She's shaking her head. To say thanks for you know a full year of this. You've been an awesome co-host. Full year of this. <laughs> yeah. See, she's getting that. She's getting that Lizzie Borden looking her right right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but in any case, but again, it, this is a, this is a great time. So we'll definitely look forward to this. We'll definitely have you on again soon. This we've been look, we've been looking to have you on for a long time. So I'm glad yeah. we finally can uh, finally connect. And hope you enjoy Texas. Yeah, sure yeah, I'm make, the land of the booth mummy. Yeah, you know, there you go. Make mommy. sure, make sure you go to Sixth Street too. Make sure, make sure she lets you out and go to Sixth Street because oh, good oh, restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of places boy can get in trouble on Sixth Street. So, oh, okay, so I'm not allowed there. I'm not probably allowed not. There. Probably Darren, not. Darren, I doubt if you would be allowed there. <laughs> oh, I have a great time. A great time on He's got a reputation. He's not allowed back. <laughs> I've, I've been to Sixth Street. Sixth Street's fantastic. It's a great time. Anyway, so um, so yeah, we look forward to talking to you soon. Again, we appreciate you jumping on with us and um. Mm -hmm. We uh, always love talking about old JWB and the gang, and we'll look forward to doing this again. We will absolutely do this again, talk more depth with some of the other guys, and maybe talk about the uh, the other five we ever get a chance to talk about. Yeah, I think we Sounds definitely great. will. So to all our listeners, thank you for uh, this is our one-year anniversary. We were happy to have Dave Taylor join us. Uh, follow him at Lynn Conspirators on Twitter, and he's on Instagram too. Um, follow him on there. He's a great follow. Um, anyway, so Darren, thank you for being the awesome co-host that you are for these last 52 episodes. You're your bobblehead there. You're um, welcome. So anyway, 
Until next week, when we will be back with you talking about the Battle of Richmond, Kentucky. So we are headed back to, I guess, Western Theater again. Anyway, Facebook Live is always Saturday at 10 a.m. And until next time, we will see you all again soon. Peace out. Bye, guys. Six Semper Duranus. (laughs) Jeez. That's the way to end it.